<laughs> Brian's got a uke, unique rela- a uke, unique relationship with Amactra, having met her founder, Roslyn, uh, when they were each working for executives at Microsoft as speechwriters, and they bonded backstage over a lot of late night rehearsals and last minute edits, you know, down to edits and one would edit and unedit the other guys and, you know, that kind of fun stuff. His six years at Microsoft completed his 20 year corporate career and for the last nine years has been lecturing, teaching and consulting to help companies and nonprofits become better communicators and build stronger customer relationships. He's worked with startups, scale ups and the Fortune 50. Most importantly, he's not just a friend of a max, he's a client. Yay. Please welcome. Yay. Yay. Thank I love you, man. <laughs> Please welcome communications expert, business thinker, and wannabe scotch whiskey expert. Hey, I didn't read this part. Yeah, well, see, JP, you got to read it. <laughs> I got to read it. Yeah, the wannabe is what part caught me. But, hey, I'd like like to welcome Brian. It's yours. Thank you. Thank you, JP, and thank you, my friends at Amaxra, for asking me in here today. Uh, those of you with long memories who have been participating in the Amaxra Coffee with an Expert uh, activities for a while uh, may recall that I was scheduled to be the speaker for Amaxra Coffee with an Expert back in March, and a little thing called coronavirus got in the way and postponed it, so I'm delighted to be back with the group. What I've got prepared for us today, and I'll I'll share my opening slide here. Uh, What I've got prepared for us today is modeled after, if any of you were at the February Coffee with an Expert, uh, my old friend Bob Wolverton, actually, let me just hit the right thing here. bad experience. Uh, My old friend Bob uh, Wolverton, he shared about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of some material that he's been working on for a while and then facilitated a discussion Uh, getting customers and the brands that they use well connected and driving customer closeness is what turns me on so i'll take you through some of my thoughts on the subject that i share with the business audiences that i get to speak in front of and then rather than do the whole keynote presentation for you I want to learn from you and I want you to have a chance to ask a whole lot of questions. So I'm going to try and facilitate mm. some dialogue that's going is to now joining some dialogue that'll get us uh, that'll get us learning from one another and reflecting on our experiences with our favorite brands. So if I can get just one person to say, yep, you can see the slides and they look good. Yes. Okay. Outstanding. Good. So. The question that I want to start us off with is not the one that's up there at the top of this cover slide, Dear Customers Love You Enough. The question starts with, what's a customer worth? What is a customer worth to our organizations? In the early 1990s, I was fresh out of business school and I started my first post B-school job at Hewlett Packard Company. I attended a training early in my sales career and I was given a paper by a noted business writer whose name now escapes me. And one story from it has stuck with me for all of these years. The author was visiting his neighborhood grocery. The supermarket might have had a greater variety or lower prices on some items. He admitted that, but he wanted to maintain the connection to his local store and he shared how they had earned this loyalty and had become a part of his life and his routine. This was, I was reading this in the early 1990s, so this must have been the 70s or 80s that the author was writing about, and the technology for validating credit cards was slow compared to today's under the best of circumstances, and it was even slower on that day. So the two of them, the merchant and the customer, just waited and waited and you can all imagine this scene because we've all waited with a stranger or a very casual acquaintance before you've got that awkward silence and then somebody makes a remark and there's a little bit of small talk and then there's more awkward silence and eventually you get the success that you're waiting for the elevator arrives or the line starts to move or the band starts in this case the credit card is authorized 
and the sale gets made. But before sending the author on his way, the merchant reached into a dish of candies for sale next to the register and just dropped a few into the grocery bag before handing it over. And as he passed the bag over, what he said was, that's for the wait, right? And thanks for waiting. And that small kindness, a couple of you know nickel candies, earned the shopkeeper a customer for life. Customer for life, think about that phrase and let me ask again, what is a customer worth? Very often this discussion begins with the customer lifetime value equation. So let's begin our discussion there. The standard approach to computing the lifetime value of a customer, CLTV, customer lifetime value, is simple, right? Just three parts to the equation. Let's look at it through the lens of this particular transaction. Input number one, it's the average order size that the customer makes with an organization. Input number two, the second variable, it's the frequency at which those transactions happen. How often does a buyer buy from the seller? And the third is the overall duration of the commercial relationship over how long a period of time is the customer transacting with the vendor. Average spend times the frequency of that spend times how long the customer interacts with you. It's pretty sensible and logical. That gets you your customer lifetime value. And if you alter any one of these three inputs, you alter the outcome, right? It's just simple math. If you increase the average spend without changing the frequency or the duration of the relationship, you're still increasing the customer lifetime value. And same for any one of the three. So in our corner store story, the shopkeeper may have increased the frequency of visits by the author. We could perhaps stipulate that, yeah. yeah and in the article that I was given, it, it confirmed that the relationship continued. So there's a check for two of the variables. We don't know if the author increased the size of his average purchase, but we do have a pretty good illustration of how to calculate customer lifetime value. Average spend, times frequency of spend, times the customer lifespan, gives you this essential piece of information. So we have the answer to our question. What is a customer worth? We've just figured it out. But in the immortal words of the singer Peggy Lee, is that all there is? Take a look at this video snippet I'm about to play. And actually I wanna, I'm gonna come off of sharing for a moment just to make sure that I've got my audio for you set up correctly. Include system audio. Take a look at this video snippet I'm about to play and think about how you would measure the lifetime value of this customer using the equation we're looking at now. How are you going to measure this particular customer's value as you watch this video. Hey guys, how's it going? I am so excited right now because in front of me is the new iPhone 10 and I'm shaking. I am shaking with excitement and I would say that this is an official official unboxing, but I actually could not even wait until I got home. So I kind of already pre-opened this at my friend's house. At the time of making this video, I've only had it for about half of a day. And in that half of a day, it has far exceeded my expectations. And that's something that I didn't actually think was possible. Like I was excited for this phone and now I'm really, really excited for it. And it's in the palm of my hand. Pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty excited, isn't she? I looked last night as I was rehearsing and I saw that this video from the iPhone 10 introduction has had 6.1 million views. Six million times plus people have watched this woman have this religious experience over the opening of her iPhone 10. And if you look at her iPhone 11 unboxing video, 6.2 million views. And she has made a total of 11 iPhone 11 related videos, accessories and comparisons against others. 
So just between the iPhone 10 and the iPhone 11, she's gotten 12 million views of people who are picking up on her excitement for this brand and their products. And having noticed that one of her videos around the iPhone 11 is a comparison of the iPhone 11 to the original iPhone, I suspect she's been doing this since the first iPhone came out. How would you value her worth to the brand named Apple? Okay, let's move on. At the time oh, of no, no at no the wait, time, stop. at the time. There you go. Here's another story. I want you to meet Sally Bailey. That's her up there in the top. Sally Bailey is a British chief executive officer who ran the fashion and home goods retailer called White Stuff before her recent retirement. In her nine years as the CEO, she grew the company from 13 million pounds of annual revenue to 113 million pounds of annual revenue. That's a compound annual growth rate. I'll spare you doing the math. Compound annual growth rate of over 30%. This is a successful CEO. Now, I'm sure that Ms. Bailey had a lot of smart business practices, but the one that caught my eye was her commitment to listening to her customers and not just listening to them, actively seeking them out and asking their opinions. She had the article that I picked this up out of, she had a personal call list of some 20 customers, their phone numbers, their email addresses, and she reached out to them basically when she felt like it, not on a particular set schedule, just when she wanted to seek their counsel. And you can imagine, you know, hi, this is Sally. We're looking at expanding into a new mall. What do you think? You know, hi, Sally Bailey here. We're thinking about carrying a new line of housewares. Do you have any experience with this brand? You know, hey, it's Sally. We're looking at a new clothing line. Do any of these catch your eye? It was holiday season a couple of years back and the company added, you know, the, the merchandisers added a cannabis cookbook to the shelves of white stuff. And hearing a grumble or two, Sally Bailey picked up the phone, called some key customers and sounded them out. And they told her that they thought that a cannabis cookbook worked against the family excuse me, the family vibe that they liked from their stores. Uh, they, they weren't prudes, they were not necessarily against pot, but they didn't think it was on brand for their white stuff. And Sally Bailey listened and the company dropped the book and they preserved their brand image in the eyes of their customers, maybe avoiding some controversy and at least avoiding some cognitive dissonance. So was having that list of customers available to speak to and being able to sound them out before making strategic decisions valuable? Absolutely no question in my mind, right? Sally ran this company with the input of the customers that she needed to be buying from the company. In the other, in the video that we saw, you know, someone is doing something that doesn't necessarily equate to customer lifetime value equation. So it was anything that we saw from this Sally Bailey story or from the way we might figure out the value of I Justine in the iPhone 10 video, was it captured in any way in that customer lifetime value equation? And, and you know, clearly no, not at all. So questions like, what is a customer worth? And the dilemma of that simple equation being too simple to capture the full picture, that's what makes me tick. In a 20 year corporate career at HP uh, with McKinsey and Company and then at Microsoft, nearly every job I had focused on building relationships. Uh, the first professional sales job I was in at Hewlett Packard was selling to existing customers and then I moved over to work on building alliances, uh, getting executives and technical people and marketers and salespeople from HP and the alliance companies I was responsible for to work together. When I was at McKinsey, I worked with practice leaders to build relationships with the key technology players in their respective spaces, pricing, insurance, you know, manufacturing, supply chain, and others. And at Microsoft, I was part of the executive engagement team. I led the company's executive briefing program 
to help executives from Microsoft and sellers from Microsoft become closer with top executives from Microsoft's top customers and partners and prospects. And then I finished up that 20 year corporate career as speechwriter, not just for a senior exec at Microsoft, but specifically for the global head of customer support. So there's been this theme through my career of you know, good communications skills and building relationships between customers and the brands that I represented. And in my consulting years since leaving big tech, I've helped a variety of clients in several industries improve their top and their bottom line by helping them become better business communicators and by bringing focus to this gold mine that they're sitting on known as their existing customer base, which is why I love asking that question, do your customers love you enough? And that's the, the talk that I often give in front of corporate audiences. I propose then a more complete taxonomy for talking about customers and how businesses measure their value. When someone buys from you once, they're a customer, of course. Two times, and you can call them a repeat customer. Great thing, right? More and more, they can become regular customers, and then you can introduce measures of quality to these quantitative measures after customer, repeat customer, regular customer. And you can start talking about going above and beyond, start talking about loyal customers, fans, advocates. Think about this. Something like 27% of the people who buy once from a brand buy a second time. 27%, that means 73 times out of 100, someone who buys from a brand does not buy from them again. And therefore your customer lifetime value equation just plain stops right there. Frequency of purchasing, one. Amount of their spend, whatever it was. Duration of relationship, give it a value of one and all you've got from that customer for the rest of their life and yours is the one purchase that they made but get them to buy a second time that 27 percent who buys a second time half of them buy a third time and you can imagine that you know the numbers dissipate but at some point you're raising up a a group of regular standing customers who you've got the chance to turn into fans and advocates and such. What happens if you move the needle just a little bit at the front end of this equation? What happens if you get a one-time customer to become two two-time customer, not 27 times out of 100, but 30 or 35 times out of 100? The ripple effect is gonna be marvelous for top and bottom line, but there's more than that, right? If you start with the purely financial return, it makes sense to orient your company towards maintaining relationships with your customers. So let's start there. Here's a view that brings two of the three elements of the customer lifetime value equation together, thanks to the world of software as a service. This anonymized chart shows a SaaS company's customer churn based on the degree to which their solution is being used by those customers. And you can see that the slopes get less steep from left to right as various thresholds get passed, more usage of the solution equals more stickiness, right? So there's a positive correlation between increasing the average order size, if you will, and increasing the duration of the commercial relationship. In plain English, the more the service gets used, excuse me, the more the service gets used, the longer it gets used. So you're driving up two of the three elements of the customer lifetime value equation at once, which tells me it is worth it to invest, to train, to build loyalty, and to make your customers love you, not just send you a monthly check that entitles them to use your solution. And now look at the way this can multiply. 87% of customers who have a good experience with your brand are gonna tell at least one other person about it. And a third of them are gonna say something nice about you to at least five others. If getting that good press were the only possible outcome, you know, all upside, if getting that good press were the only possibility, it would be worth it to work on building those customer relationships. But the numbers for talking about a bad experience are even more staggering because 90, 95% 
of people who are dissatisfied with you are going to say something to at least one contact and over half of unhappy customers are gonna say something to at least five contacts. So forgetting about the upside, just as a blocking strategy alone, trying to prevent people from saying bad things about you, it is worth investing to keep your customers happy so they don't say those bad things about you. And if that weren't enough, consider all the other ways in which having a closer relationship with your customers brings value to your company, right? Let's let's use our friend I Justine as an example. You know, some of these customers that feel good about you and who are saying good things about you are going to become the source of referrals. And what's more valuable than a warm lead coming to you from a good customer? You've got a potential to reduce your cost of sales, shorten your sales cycle amplify your marketing and your sales messaging, all good stuff, all user generated. And the customers who feel engaged and close to your brand, who don't outright refer, you can still ask them to provide references in sales cycles as the right mix of geography or industry or use cases align. Or general testimonials you can put on your website, your sales literature and your marketing pieces. Uh, executive speeches, even employee motivation or partner recruitment. Think about Sally Bailey and the customers who are happy to be her advisors. In my time at Microsoft, I helped build customer advisory groups. And thanks to the, to the relationships that we built, we had a ready-made set of go-to partners whose names we could provide to press and analysts, people we could ask to speak at events, sit on panels, Right? And there's more, success stories and case studies. Put a customer's name in lights and can play to an individual executive's ego in a way that makes them even more willing to stay loyal through thick and through thin. You know, happy customers can be the ones who interpret being asked to try out new products as a benefit or a privilege. I mean, any of us who've ever been on a technology company's beta list know that that can be a mixed blessing. The ones who are gonna see it as all positive are the ones who see your brand as an agent of their gaining competitive advantage. And you both get to be then the hero of their story. So let's summarize where we are now. The benefits of bringing, excuse me, the benefits of bringing your customers closer are both varied and significant. You can remove friction from the sales process for that customer and any of the warm intros that they might make. You've got proof for your claims for ads, sales, press, analysts, and by bringing the customer's voice into your planning and decision making, you're keeping your finger on the pulse of the market. Right? And with each new commitment you get a customer to make by asking them to support you and your brand and your solutions, you're locking a thought in their head, right? Subtly, you're commingling their image of you with their self image. Now this is, you know, masters and, and doctorate level stuff at some point, but if you can get your customers to love you more, you are getting them to see themselves as a part of your brand. So take this example from the nonprofit world. A few years ago, I worked with an executive director and her staff, uh, as well as her board to plan what was gonna be a critical fundraiser for the nonprofit. We worked together to develop the ED's speech for the event. We included presentations from students who had been through the awareness training that the organization does about domestic violence and sexual abuse. And we made sure that among the attendees at this nonprofit event, that their wallets and their voices loosened up a little by inviting a bunch of Washington State wineries to provide tasting pours as they featured their wares for sale and for auction at the event. And what we wanted was a way to connect the nonprofit's brand and message to their donors and to lock that connection into the donors' heads. 
Uh, Robert Cialdini and his book Influence, which it wouldn't surprise me if many of you were familiar with, you know, in his book Influence, Cialdini chronicles the power of consistency, of acting in accordance with what you publicly commit to, and it's huge. So we created the following experience for our attendees. We produced a variety of two-sided postcards. You see an example here on the left. There's the one side for the address and the other side where we're asking them a question and asking them to write something. And over on the right on that corkboard, you can see a few other of the varieties, you know, the four aces along with the, the, the two women. We set up a table with lots of these postcards and pens right along the path that included all of the wineries representatives so that it was nearly impossible to navigate the event without passing by our team. And we asked everyone to write their address on the one side, because after all, it is a postcard. And we asked for them to write a few words on the other side to say how they were going to engage with and live the values of the organization. As you can see on the on the card, we've got this. How will you demonstrate your commitment to these wave three core wave foundation values tonight and in the future? And those values, as you can see, there are awareness, community and empowerment. We provided the incentive of a drawing for a double wag, double magnum of wine for those who completed the card. And we put all the completed cards, as you can see here on the right, with their commitment side out on a cork board so everybody could feel a little bit of peer pressure to participate and read each other's statements of how they felt connected to this mission and how they were going to demonstrate their commitment to these values. And what we felt was that the simple act of declaring a commitment to the group and its values was going to influence the live auction we were about to hold. And we were right. Not only did the event raise 100% more than the year prior with roughly the same number of guests, but eight months later, we took all the postcards, slapped a save the date sticker for the next year's event onto them, and obviously when it reached the recipient, it was yet another reminder to them that they felt kinship with this nonprofit and with their mission. We helped increase the amount of love that our customers, in this case donors, felt for the brand, the nonprofit, the Wave Foundation, and it paid off, no pun intended from the, the playing cards, it paid off in spades. I've experienced this same one commitment reinforces another commitment dynamic with companies ranging from startups to you know, hundred billion dollar behemoths, some of which are here in our backyard in the Pacific Northwest. So if we're clear that there are multiple ways to earn return on investment by building customer closeness, how do we actually do it? The conversations that I have with my clients is that it starts with audience focused and benefit led communications that you need programs for building loyalty and trust and that you've got to have a culture of engaging customers and even more important listening to them right it's not enough to to do outward facing things where they decide they love you for their own reasons you've got to really demonstrate that you're listening to them you can let them help shape your planning your strategy and this is where in the full keynote, I'd start walking through examples of great communications and quality programs, <clears throat> excuse me, and ways to build the right culture. But let's stop here. We're a little bit past the bottom of the hour and we've got till the top. And let's spend some time learning from one another. <clears throat> the first question I'd love to ask you is, you know, do you have a brand that you love? Please take yourself off of moot take yourself off of mute. I'd love to know about good experiences that you've had with a brand, whether business to business or business to consumer. Just, I'm sure everyone's felt like some brand really gets them. Let's talk about that for a sec. And given that I can't really see, I guess there is a hand raising capability, but let me invite you just for the moment, it's not a million of us on the line. Please come off of mute and give me an idea of what are the brands that you love and why, and what are they doing to keep you interested, 
buying from them and loyal. Hello. Hey, Brian. This is hey, you're going to be brave, Beth? I'll be brave. Be brave. I'll, I'll actually say Acura. Nice. And what about and it? Acura, because we had multiple Acuras. Uh, the service center locally has been a wonderful company to deal with. Uh, we've never had an issue in terms of getting service, never having to take the car back. They provide loaner cars and what have you. So it's just been a good experience all around. Just know that they're going to take care of us when we need their help. I like it. Good. Who else has a brand that they feel strongly about? Hey, Brian, JP. Yes. Uh, 25 or so years ago when I moved here, there was an auto shop two doors down from my work that was recommended to me by, you know, my uh, partner. Took it there, Summers Automotive in Kirkland. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you those guys over the years, any car I had, any car I wanted, you know, they'd go, um, you know, free of charge, go take a look. You know, have me run it to them, go through it, make sure it worked. Any time I had, you know, any any sort of things that needed to be done to it, they'd offer to come pick it up, offer to come drop it off. They were just a small business. I think there was five of them. They retired last year, so sad. But, you know, it just felt like, you know, they'd call, ask about the dog. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was completely personal. Well, and, yeah, what I'm hearing is yeah, they took a personal interest in you, which is just awesome. Yeah, I had an employee that blew up a motor in one of my cars, <laughs> and, and the guy, you know, offered to fix, you know, a local guy over there offered to fix the car, and I'm like, absolutely not. You know, if I'm going to spend, you know, eight to ten grand on a new motor, I'm taking it to these guys. And, uh, you know, I, I, another story, and then I'll finish, was yeah. they had crimped, when they put the new motor in, they had crimped a fuel line, mm. and about three weeks later you know, I started smelling fuel in the car. I'm like, what is it? They go, we'll look for it and everything else and couldn't find it. They absolutely pulled the motor, put in a new fuel line and put it back at no cost. Mm -hmm. So there's my story. Yeah, no, good customer service is, is absolutely a way to build loyalty. And there are definitely companies that need to pay attention to their customer support, customer service function as part of their full strategy to win more customer love and have the the resultant top line gains, bottom line gains and reputational gains. Who else? Thank you, Amax for friends for jumping in. I see we've got several guests on the line. I'd love to hear how you uh, how you either have experienced other brands that serve you in your personal or commercial life, or if there's something that your organizations are doing to try to build customer closeness and how it's been working. We need one brave person to get us rolling. I can give an example of a, a strategy that I heard that I thought was really remarkable, but not one that I've used or actually experienced. Yeah, go for it, Kim. Uh, I was at a conference for the Society of Marketing Professional Services a couple years ago, the annual build, build Business Conference, and they did a series of lightning talks. And one uh, presentation talked about a gentleman who owned a believer roofing repair business. It was a smaller, not a national brand, obviously a smaller guy. Um, but what he did to inspire customer loyalty was that during the course of a project, he would send a weekly or bi-weekly update video. This is what we've done to date. This is what's left to do. Um, so basically he nurtured the customer experience from contract signing to the end, knowing that you would need constant touches during project duration in order to engender trust and to build trust, to build respect, and um, ultimately to build his brand and recognition for his quality service. So it was it was about customer service, but it was a act that he took that went above and beyond. 
I love that. that. Thank you very much, Kim. That That's terrific. Anybody else got one or I've got another couple of prompts that hopefully will get us all talking. Hi, this is, hi, this is Aaron Berard. Yeah, hi, Aaron. Hi, sorry, sorry, I just I couldn't unmute myself in time. Yeah. Um, just a quick one. Um, uh, Ikea for me, because I have lived um, abroad in Europe in three different countries, um, also in the States, all over the States. And um, it's, uh, I guess it's consistency. They're mm -hmm. consistent in their policies throughout the world. And I think it's their return policy is what keeps me loyal, knowing that you can bring home a kit for a light, you know, return it to them. It doesn't work. Return it to them in 50,000 pieces and they'll take it, no questions asked. Um, and they also um, let you re recycle your furniture, your old IKEA furniture to them. And, you know, it's just this kind of cusp from the product life si cycle. They're looking out for the environment. Terrific example. Thank you. Yeah, I, you make me think my parents uh, bought a mattress from Costco, which has a famously liberal return policy. Uh, maybe I think it was seven or eight years ago and it was a 10 year warranty on the mattress and things started going wrong with it seven or eight years in. And my mother, I God knows how many times my 81 year old mother has now told yeah, some stranger about what a great store Costco is because of how easy they made it to turn in this you know, old, this eight year old mattress without any questions asked. They, they had a dissatisfied customer, they solved the problem for her. And you know, my my mom, as as moms in general and 80 year old moms in particular, and maybe we could even add Jewish moms in particular, are you know she's she's got a mouth and she was gonna say something to people one way or another. How nice that she felt this connection. This is the same Costco, by the way, where she had called to find out if certain things were in stock. And the person on the other end of the line recognizing that they were talking with someone older and, and not wanting my folks to put themselves in any jeopardy with the coronavirus said, tell you what, give me your list. I'll do your shopping and I'll meet you out in front. Now, this is not a service that is generally offered, but here is an employee on behalf of their brand going above and beyond and essentially doing my parents shopping and just loading the stuff into their trunk. I love that story and and it's it's a great way to build loyalty when you empower your people on the front lines to go above and beyond. A lot of places where people notice loyalty is around the brands that they identify with, which is often clothing or shoes or something like that or uh, you know handbags or what about you know some of the the more prosaic things? So we're not talking software as a service or uh, furniture or automobiles. Anybody here a Nike person versus an Adidas person, or someone who wouldn't be seen dead at the gym if not in their Lululemon? Anybody? What's Lululemon? Now don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> and um, I I'm, I'm going to awesome. go with Eddie Bauer. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, Eddie Bauer uh, was was shocked. I bought a coat 14 years ago from yeah. them, and two two years ago. And I know Roz and Mike have heard this story to death, so I've told at least five people about it. You know, I walked into the store because I had a zipper stuck on a. It was so oh, 12, 13 years old. I had no idea. I was thinking it was Ooh. five. Walked in and go, hey, I've got a zipper stuck in this jacket. And she goes, well, go over and get another one. There's one right there. And I was like, well. Well, you know, wait a minute. You know, it's 12 years old. I'm happy to pay for it. She goes, oh, no, no, no. It's the rules. I was, I was shocked. Uh, go get a new coat. 12 years. Oh. She looked it up and she goes, yeah, you know, you bought this thing 12 years ago. I'm like, wow. Okay. That's terrific. Eddie and, Bauer and that, for life. <laughs> well, right. And that kept you from going to Outdoor Research or to REI or to right. whomever else. Right. And you know that when you do need to buy something because you don't have a broken one to turn in, 
you're going to go back to Eddie Bauer, right? You're going to at least right. give them you know, a second look before you go purchase from anywhere else. Absolutely. Um, this makes me think, I mean, the, the famous example of the liberal return policy is from our you know, other Northwest friends at Nordstrom, where the story possibly apo- possibly apocryphal is the person who decided that they didn't want the snow tires that they had and took the you know, went to Nordstrom and said, I've got snow tires. Will you take them back? And Nordstrom allegedly took back the snow tires, even though Nordstrom never in its hundred plus year history had sold snow tires. I like that story because it demonstrates the the psychology of it and the lengths to which the brand has decided it will go in order to maintain customer satisfaction. There's a reasonable debate as to whether if they could demonstrate that they had never sold tires and the sale was not made there, whether this person had a receipt or not, uh, you know, knowing that this person wouldn't have had a receipt Anyway, they, they, if they could have demonstrated to this person that there really was no way they could have returned, they could have bought the snow tires there, that still seems like it would not be an unreasonable thing. But given a choice, they put frontline people in charge and frontline people got to make the decision. And I love that you know, empowering frontline people to help out customers, especially in that business to consumer environment. But think about it in a business to business environment, too. I recently... Uh, worked with a colleague of mine at a consulting firm down in the Bay Area that I often collaborate with. He was talking about now that we're locked in our homes doing a lot of virtual work, he was really starting to gain an appreciation for what his wife does for a living, and he had observed the following. His wife is a salesperson with a particular technology brand And in order to get sales for the end of that company's fiscal year, he, his his wife's company had said, hey, we're going to put on a a decent sized promotion for anybody who buys from us before the end of the fiscal year. And rapidly, the wife got a couple of deals in flight, a couple of interested parties, and one of them was not quite quick enough to pull the trigger and make the purchase before the turn of the month that marked the turn of that company's fiscal year. And when they came back within a day or two of the start of the new fiscal year and said, we're finally ready, we've got all our ducks in a row, if you'll honor the pricing, we'll honor our commitment to purchase, and the company would not allow the salesperson to make that deal. Now, I don't know what made the deal any less attractive two days after the turn of the fiscal year than it would have been a minute before the fiscal year changed, but the company made a decision that my friend who was writing this article just excoriated. How can you do business like that? What are you saying to your customers? And are you giving any slack whatsoever? That seems like a perfect way. It it seems perfectly designed to get that negative reaction that I spoke of near the front of the piece, where 95% of people who have a negative reaction with your negative interaction with your brand are going to say something to at least one person and over half are going to talk to at least five people. This company would have so inexpensively bought some loyalty by saying, you know, you are a few, you are a couple of days past the turn of the calendar and we're still going to honor instead they caused all sorts of headaches what were they saying to the front line to the salesperson we can't we won't put any authority in your hands you have to tow the company line what were they saying to the customer we value your business but not that much and what were they allowing that customer to say to others so absolutely critical to be there for your customers Others, we had asked about uh, you know, shoes and clothing and things like that. Anybody got some thoughts? While you're pondering, let me throw another one out there that hopefully will get some of you off of mute. How are you today bringing customer opinions and ideas 
into your business. There's a variety of ways that we can listen to our customers, both informally and formally. I'd love to hear from anybody. How are you getting your customers to talk to you and how are you receiving their information? Kim, you were brave once. Would you like to be brave again? I see Robert. I see, ah, Artie, nice to see you on the line. All right, well, this may be a reasonable place to turn things over then uh, back to our friends from Amaxra. I hope that you've been inspired by some of these stories of building customer closeness. I hope that I've given you a new way of thinking about evaluating customer lifetime value and going above and beyond just a simple uh, three-part equation, each one of which has to do with either time or money, and recognize that there are plenty of ways from referrals to references to willingness to stand up and say nice things about you, even to potentially defend you in social media, to try your products ahead of others and be a beta tester for you, to serve in a formal or informal way as an advisor, either with something like a customer or partner advisory council or just an occasional ad hoc reach out from, from you to your customers. There's so many ways that your customers can help you drive your business above and beyond what they spend with you that you know, the, the world is your oyster. Once you've got a customer, you've got the most valuable thing that your company can acquire. And what you make of that is entirely up to you. If this has sparked some thoughts and you want to talk more, you know how to reach me. Uh, and I would love to have a deeper conversation uh, to help you figure out what it is that you can be doing inside of your organization. JP, Beth, Roz, Mike, just thanks a million for giving me the opportunity to share a couple of thoughts and stimulate a little bit of discussion. I wish you all a, a, a happy and meaningful Juneteenth and hope that you all stay safe and healthy with what's going on out there. Thanks, everybody.